I'm Erin, Chief Strategy Officer here at Data, a fractional marketing company serving B2B businesses in the manufacturing, software, and architecture, engineering, and construction industries. I lead our consulting team, and I'm responsible for research and development around emerging technologies, just like generative AI. And I want to start with a caveat. I've given this presentation multiple times this year. Every time I've had to update big chunks. I last gave this presentation less than a month ago. And in that time span, ChatGPT fired and rehired its CEO. The model itself evolved and launched new functionality. And Google, just in this past week, released a huge new update. This is a very fast moving field. And what we talk about now will be or already is slightly out of date. But it is a good start. So let's dive in, starting with definitions. So my goal in this slide and in the next one is to contextualize what we're talking about today. Artificial intelligence, or AI, in and of itself is a very broad term. The concept has been in human brains for millennia, going all the way back to at least the ancient Greeks. And the big problem with this term is that we don't really have a standard definition of intelligence, which makes this term pretty useless. But it's the term we have. This presentation is specifically about generative AI, and this is the true innovation that's spurring the current craze in the media and making the news cycles. So artificial intelligence isn't new. It's actually already omnipresent in a lot of the tools you use every day. Like right now, I'm not standing in front of a green screen with Zoe back here quickly editing things. Zoom has AI that puts me in front of a green screen and determines based on my camera and how it's viewing the pixels, what should be background and what should be me. So generative AI, however, is new as of basically last year, this year. And that's AI that creates new unique output based on its training. And this is the field that's evolving maybe the most rapidly right now. And in the next slide, we'll put it into a little more context. So what made this generative AI, AI that can create, what made that possible? This Russian doll analogy is helpful to visualize the evolution and relationship between AI technologies. First, we have AI, which we've already said is a useless term. A better term would be machine learning. Machine learning really just means that you have some initial data and that you use that data to build an algorithm. This is pretty broad still, but infinitely more useful than just saying intelligence because intelligence has no definition. From there, a subset of machine learning, a specific type of machine learning, would be neural networks. And neural networks are algorithms that mimic how our brains actually function. It's like a computer program that learns to make guesses about data. And they use basically artificial neurons arranged in layers to process information, like identify if a picture is of a cat or a dog, by analyzing input data, such as the photo pixels. And initially, the network's guesses probably are pretty bad, pretty incorrect but it improves over time by learning from its own errors, tweaking its neuron connections to enhance accuracy. And over time, this process makes it proficient at prediction, much like a brain strengthens its neural pathways for us to learn better. So that's neural networks. Then we have a subset of neural networks, which is deep learning. And deep learning is a fun term because it sounds really mysterious and cool, but what it means is it's a more complex neural network. So the definition is a neural network with more than three layers of artificial neurons. Sounds cool, though. And then what we have as a subset of deep learning, and the thing that's really propelled us forward today is transformer models. And I like to explain transformer models with a joke about engineers. I can do this because I married one. So let's say I sent my engineer husband to the store, and I gave him very clear instructions to a human. I said, please buy a gallon of milk, and if they have eggs, buy a dozen. And he comes back with 12 gallons of milk. Now, most husbands would not do this, and thankfully, neither would my husband. But 12 gallons of milk is the logical outcome of that sentence. If you don't have the context and the meaning, we embed it in that sentence. A human knows you don't buy 12 gallons of milk, but that you do always buy eggs in qualities of a dozen. And so it would put together the logic. This is what a transformer model does. Unlike earlier models that process data sequentially, one piece after another without looking back, Transformers look at the entire sequence of data, like a whole sentence or even a whole paragraph, all at once. It does this to its training data, which lets it understand relationships. Doesn't usually means eggs, doesn't usually mean milk. And it does this to the input. It understands that when I say the dog chased its tail, it means the dog. This transformer model technology 
is the technology that has actually made generative AI possible. And then finally, we have large language models. This is what we're generally referring to when we're talking about generative AI. Not always, there are different models, but large language models. This is what ChatGPT and other text-based generative AIs are. This term is mostly in reference to the training materials, which in ChatGPT's case is an unimaginable amount of text. We fed it nearly the entirety of the internet, nearly all of English literature. And the result is something that's almost uncanny in its ability to understand us and its ability to generate what feels like human-created content. But at the end of the day, what it is a pattern recognition machine. It recognizes patterns in the input and it matches that in the patterns it outputs. All right, so let's talk a few specifics. ChatGPT is not the only large language model out there, but it's got the brand name recognition. You also have Bard from Google, which just launched its uh, Gemini Pro model. You have Claude from Anthropic. Anthropic is split off from ChatGPT or from OpenAI. Uh, you have Llama from Facebook and Meta. That's an open source that you can install on your computer if you are that geeky. And of course, you have Elon trying to get in the game with Grok, which is his spicy LLM. And they all work about the same way. They take input, usually text, but they're all branching out into multimodal input, so code and imagery. And they predict what their response should be based on their massive amounts of training data. And that predict word is important. Chat, GPT, and other large language models do not know the right answer. They also don't really care about the right answer. They have trillions of parameters making them really accurate, but it's not 100%. And you can think of this as an advanced form of autocomplete on your phone, operating at a massively more complex scale. But at the end of the day, what each of these really are is pattern recognizers who predict what the pattern should be based on your input, and they send it back to you. Uh, it is accurate enough that it has seen incredible widespread adoption, and it's incredibly easy to use. I've heard from a few people that they haven't tried it and wouldn't even know where to start. So I want to just jump into it for a minute and get rid of that barrier to entry. So let me broaden my screen share here. All right, I have a pro account, so I get GPT-4. And you can see here, I have asked it to create an image of a cat knocking a full glass of wine off the counter, which if you are both a wine drinker and a cat owner, you have probably encountered this scenario. Let's see what it can tell us. Let's ask it to write us a poem about the scenario we just laid out. All right, so I will say it's gotten better at poetry since it launched, for sure. Not a best poem. It's not going to win any awards. Well, let's ask it to make it into a haiku. And this is just a very basic format, but it's one of the ways I like to get people interacting with ChatGPT because it's very simple and a fun one to do with kids and stuff. So you'll notice a few other things. Here, I have the option to upload files to ChatGPT, I can, for instance, upload a very long PDF and ask it to summarize it for me. I can upload Excel sheets of data and ask it to summarize the findings or to actually do data analysis. I'll talk about use cases in the next slide or so here, but it essentially gives everyone the capabilities to really be a data analyst without knowing Python or without understanding more advanced coding techniques. It also, as you saw, can generate images. I'll touch on that just a little bit more, but I wanted to get everyone familiar with just what is the interface? Because I hear from a lot of people, I wouldn't even know how to start. You know how to type in a box, you know how to start. 3.5 is the free version. It's okay for true kind of full power chat GPT. You do want to pay the $20 a month for GPT-4. Or you could choose from many of these other models. The other thing I want to just briefly touch on because this launched in the past uh, a few weeks here, is ChatGPT actually launched the capability for you to make a mini version of ChatGPT and customize it for your own uses by feeding it essentially your own training data. So I've been playing with that technology here at Data. I haven't shown the rest of the team this yet, but we have 
created BrandBot. And BrandBot has our style guide in it. It has information on our audiences in it. It has a bunch of examples of imagery. It has our sales process in it. And what I'm hoping to build here is a resource that our team then can use to do things like create an image of a give it a few minutes. And normally, if I asked this question or gave this prompt to uh, chat GPT outside of a customized one, it would give me a relatively generic image, probably relatively photorealistic of this scenario. It would get the scenario right. In this case, I have customized this GPT with our own image style, so it should spit out an image that adheres to our brand guidelines and that would be ready for use in PowerPoints. Ah, it failed. Well, I'll give another example. I will say this has been both a fascinating exercise and a little bit of an exercise in frustration, but it has cool potential. And ChatGPT has published a lot of GPTs that are specialty built. So now here, it's actually pretty smart. It's reciting the details of our uh, audience profiling to us. And yes, oh, well, Zoe, that looks correct to me. Well, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip back. And keep going here. All right. So here are some of the simplest use cases I've seen people start using ChatGPT or other models for. It's really ideal for those I have to write something, but I don't know where to start blank page, blank mind moments. It can create a code and tell you how to use it. We have an employee at Data who's super smart, but not a coder, doesn't know any languages, doesn't know HTML, et cetera. In one weekend, and this was months ago, early on, he was able to use ChatGPT to create a custom Chrome plugin that would scan websites and report back on the key functionality. And ChatGPT, he started with the concept and just through question asking and prompting with ChatGPT, it walked him through every step of it. It's fantastic to use for initial research, one tip here is you should always ask it to give you sources where you can verify the information because it can and will lie to you with all the glibness of a two-year-old. No shame. And then as I showed you, the pro version of ChatGPT has a model specifically for data analysis that's intensely powerful. So you upload your spreadsheet or other data, it can manipulate it. You don't need to know formulas anymore. It will help you with that. And then finally, sometimes it's just fun. And this is something I like to engage in with my own kids because this is going to be their future. When it comes to sales and marketing use cases, this is where we've probably seen the broadest immediate adoption. You can create content much faster. You can train it on your brand voice or you can develop prompts that prompt it to use your brand voice so you can quickly generate just the little snippets or large snippets of text you need. You can use it to get started with a blog. You could feed it a blog you've written. You could feed it a blog outline and ask it to create a, a full thing. In general, I don't see many people using the copy exactly as it spits it out, but it gives you a starting point. And then where you've seen it, it's starting to get into other more specific use cases. And I'll go through some demos and a few slides here on it can generate things like podcasts. It can generate things like video. And we'll see more and more of this. The other thing we've had some success here at Data With is using it to automate and enhance parts of our sales outreach. So Luke, our founder, does a lot of BD work. Luke does not always love writing lots of words. So he uses ChatGPT probably on a daily basis to help him with writing sales sequence emails. And one trick he'll do is he'll put together the basic thoughts he wants to share with the customer. And then he'll say, hey, create an email sequence for this based on the model of ADA, which would be attention, interest, desire, and action. And sure enough, It'll generate him a template of four to five emails, and he just has to edit and tweak those to his satisfaction. And then one that a couple of us use daily here at Data is a tool like TimeOS, which sits on Zoom meetings, records all of them, and then actually summarizes and creates notes for us. There's a bunch of tools out there. TimeOS, for me, is where I've found the best balance of budget-friendly to really good notes. So if you're always 
running from meeting to meeting and don't ever feel like you have time to run, to sit down and really establish notes, a tool like that, I absolutely encourage you to test out. Extended uses. We are seeing generative AI uses go in every direction all at once. So people are selling the ability to have a chat bot on your website. The downside of this is if you're going to put a chat bot on your website and use your website for source training material, your website needs to be really accurate. And I probably speak for a few of us when there's probably some updates we could do. In more complex industrial or kind of factory floor situations, you can do digital twins of your building and actually run simulations with AI. Kind of have AI run millions of different scenarios, thousands of different scenarios, and come up with the ones that achieve the results you want. Like I showed with GPTs, you can have enterprise-specific where large language, mod large language models trained on your own data. Again, this requires data. You have to have this stuff organized. One thing we'll continue to see is software just continuously embeds AI. Every single platform you own, if it's at all modern, probably is talking to you about how they're integrating AI, and those conversations will just continue. All right, image generation. This is the other way we've seen generative AI really take off. We've talked about large language models, and diffusion models are another AI model that's essentially trained on making an image real blurry, and then the AI makes it unblurry again. And sounds complex, it is, but essentially these are AIs that are trained both on language and on huge image data sets. And there's been some uproar around that. The output of these is not always eligible for copyright because of the fact that it is generated from other artists' initial work. Now, it's important to note, it is generating entirely new pieces of art. It is not finding a piece of art that matches your prompt. And some examples of platforms that do this would be DALI, which is OpenAI. It's integrated with ChatGPT. It's what we saw when we used it for this image and then for our cartoon cat image. Midjourney, which is a little more complex, stable diffusion, which is for more complex needs still. And then Adobe and Canva both have capabilities built in. I just want to note, all these images were generated by me in Midjourney. None of them are real. But let's go ahead and pop into a few. So I've shown you Dolly. Now I want to show Photoshop real quick. So this is the image that we created in Dolly. And then wait. What you do in Photoshop is you create a selection and say, hey, I want this image here. And it goes ahead and generates it. So you can see here this chunk of cheese. It looks like it belongs in this illustration. Similarly, this bottle of wine, not part of the original composition. And you can see that Photoshop is contextually smart. The cheese is in focus. The wine is blurry. It's matching it to the background around it. A better example, this is this photo of my family. I really love it, right? In reality, things were a little bit different. There was no tree there. There was no tree there. There was no tree there. There was no road. With a chair bed, chair bed. And that was like a sports unit. Well, that was a pen, no tent. And actually, this to start with. And that's the real power that Photoshop has brought forward. Now, Photoshop's not the only one. We also have Illustrator. So Illustrator came out a little more recently than Photoshop with its AI capabilities. And it functions essentially the same. You create a selection, you type in a prompt, and then it gives you three variations to choose from. So this is my... And it also gives you the ability to choose four types of kind of guides creation style. So this is an example of a subject created in AI. And you can see these are fully editable, scalable vectors. Uh, here's one that's a scene. It's a holiday scene. Very cute. Icon. It's so-so. I've seen better looking dogs. It's still learning. And then pattern. So very powerful. Again, nothing we couldn't do before with humans, but a ton faster and still editable by humans. All right, I'm going to briefly cover some other kind of use cases and tools that I think at least are very compelling. Video generation. Just like we used a prompt to generate a full video in ChatGPT, Runway ML is one app that is generating videos based off of prompts. This is four seconds of video based on a prompt. This building doesn't exist anywhere. 
looks like drone footage, not real. Audio generation. So we're seeing it in three different categories, two different categories. So there's musical generation and then there's voice generation. And within voice generation, you have stuff that's maybe more aimed at vocals and you have stuff that's more aimed at presentations like I'm doing today. And I'll just hop over real quick to show Music LM, which is Google's test version. So I ran a few beforehand, but basically it works the same as any other prompter. You enter your prompt in here, it gives you two options. So I decided to start with disco and hopefully you guys can hear this okay. Okay. You know, it'd probably be better if it's actually the B dudes or something. For a start, not bad. And then Laura, our COO, suggested that I try boy bank. So again, it's not the best. And this is test kitchen for a reason. This is not really commercially applicable. We are seeing use cases that are and other paid apps are rising here. This one particularly has limitations around you can't prompt it with an artist and can't expect vocals out of it. But pretty soon, AI creation is going to be omnipresent in audio and video. Going back to the presentation real quick here. The other one I want to show just real quickly. This popped up just a few weeks ago with Hey Gen, which basically lets you upload a few seconds of footage, I think 30 seconds to two minutes of footage of you talking, and it generates an AI clone. And I'll just show you mine real quick here. Hi, I'm Aaron's AI video clone. I was made from about 30 seconds of recordings. I'm a little uncanny valley, but give me a couple of years and you won't even need meet Aaron anymore. I'll admit that was a use case that had me astonished when I saw the output. I tried a few tools prior and they were all pretty clunky. This is the first one that fooled people close to me. Give it a little bit and Zoe won't even need me for these webinars. She'll just write what she wants me to say. I can do other things. All right. What's applicable here immediately? And I think generative AI in the office, we all have some kind of, this is cool, I want to use it, but what do I need to think about before letting all my employees use it or maybe using it myself professionally? And this is what we've seen at Data is you need to have a usage policy and guardrails. You need to talk about what you can use for data input and what's not okay to use as data input. And in general, if you wouldn't put it on the open web, if you wouldn't want your competitor to see it, maybe don't upload it to the free version of ChatGPT. They do have guardrails in place, but you want to be careful. You want to talk as a team about what's acceptable versus non-acceptable use cases. So here at Data, we do allow people to use AI in their work, but they better check it all. Accuracy is not something we're willing to negotiate on for the sake of efficiency. A human needs to do quality review and touch it and edit it. And as part of that, you do need to define what that QA process and human oversight looks like. And the other thing to keep in mind is, so Chad GPT and other large language models in and of themselves, they're not biased because they're not real. They're not real people. They can't have biases. But what can have biases is their data sets. And so if you go to most image generators, for example, and you say, show me a business person, it'll be a white male. And that's because we have way more stock photography of white males that match the keyword business person than we do of diverse other types of people. So countering the bias in our own data set that we train these models off of, that requires that human oversight again. And we could potentially have the LLMs build in controls around that and things to guide it. I think Adobe actually does have some of this, but ultimately it takes a human touch to make sure that just because the past average is what it's referencing, that's not what we carry forward. So what we highly recommend is having both a client-facing disclosure and a usage policy internally. I know that we have both of these at data. And when we did start our, just as an example, when we started our AI beta process, when I went around to each team, in each team, there was you know, one to two people who were passionate about AI who were already testing fringe use cases for AI and applying it to their work. But they were more cautious than they, you know, they were cautious because they didn't want to overstep bounds because they didn't know where those boundaries are. So by opening up this conversation and defining kind of the playground, you actually open up innovation and you encourage others to get on board with it. Real quick here as we wrap up today, takeaways. Go play with it. 
If you haven't started using ChatGPT, it's not a big commitment. Go sign up for an account, test it out, get a little used to it and familiarize, familiarize yourself with it. This, this is the future of where business is heading, like it or not. Go play with it. And for me, it, it's also about making sure the children in your life are getting exposure to this. Schools don't know how to handle AI. They're figuring it out. They're not really built to figure it out quickly. But we know that for the kids that are in school today, this is the future of their careers. This would be like us not having access to Google. And if you think of school's response in terms of don't use chat GPT for essays, feels like when I was in school and got told I wouldn't always have a calculator in my pocket. So they need to know how to use it. They need to know how it works. At a business level, what you need to think about is a lot of people are jumping forward to how can AI help my business move forward? And what you actually need to think about is what's the data that I need to enable access to or surface for AI to be useful in my business? So thinking through where are all the junctures that data gets generated that I want insights on or that I can use to fuel AI? We recommend implementing a beta program. Sales and marketing, great place to start. Media use cases there and very low risk. And then share those use cases that you find. Share those experiences with your fellow humans. So wrapping up today, no one really can predict where this is all headed. We know it's a big inflection point. We know it's as big as mobile was. It might be as big as internet available to the public was. Staying on top of it, staying informed, and just playing with it is going to be critical. And then finally, I do just want to note We'll make this PowerPoint available in PDF form after the fact because there's some really good prompt tips and further resources and reading available in here. But I know that was a whirlwind of information. Thank you for joining us here today. Please reach out if you have questions about what we covered today or if you just want to chat through use cases or bounce something off of us. We'd, we'd love to talk to you about this emerging field.